Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the final bar. Today, we'll talk about the S&P continuing to chip away higher. We had that distribution uh, yesterday, but none of that today with the S&P continuing to uh, move to the upside, teasing the S&P 3400 level. That ultimate resistance level did not quite get there. Technology with, uh, with its foot on the gas pedal and stocks like Tesla ripping back up to the, uh, to the upside. So is it setting us up for a potential upside from here, or is this the double top we want to be paying attention to. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Good afternoon. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a sunny and somewhat cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for our show as we attempt to make sense of these markets that, that seem nonsensical at times. But again, it's not about what the market could do or should do or wants to do. It's what the market is doing. We're focusing on the trends on where we see momentum, on where we see opportunities, and, and most importantly, connecting the short term of what we're seeing today with the, uh, the long term of the, uh, the trends and how they evolve. S&P 3400 is sort of that ultimate resistance level you know, we have been talking about, so many have been focusing on, and there's bound to be some, some interesting movements when we get to that level. I think we're right in that sweet spot where you see rotations, where you see people skeptical of further advances. A lot have talked about that resistance at 3,400, now, now we're there. And so, you know, regardless of what goes from here, looking at the charts is certainly going to, uh, going to help to serve you, uh, serve you well. I uh, wanted to uh, point out some of the guests we have. I, I didn't mention in the introduction, but I'm super, super excited to have Jane Galena joining us. Uh, Airplane Jane from cjanetrade.com. Uh, Jane has done such a great job with Your Daily Five, one of the other shows on Stock Charts TV. I'm really excited to have her on and talk about some of the larger tech names that I know many of us are thinking about. Tomorrow, we have Ari Wall joining us from Oppenheimer. Next week, on Tuesday the 18th, Jesse Felder. On Wednesday, Katie Stockton from Fairlead Strategies. And on Thursday the 20th, Samantha LaDuke from LaDuke Trading. So some, some wonderful guests, some capable strategists and traders to uh, give you a little bit of a look inside their process and where they see opportunity. And one more uh, upcoming event tomorrow, August 13th, our next episode of The Pitch. That's where I'll invite three strategists on the show we spend about 45 minutes, uh, each of them pitching five ideas, and then we discuss them as a group. It's a lot of fun. You will leave with some entertainment, but also some actionable investment ideas. So join us for the pitch tomorrow. Let's get to our, uh, to our market recap. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking about stocks as always, thinking about this long-term resistance level. But to be honest with you, as I'm preparing for the show, I, I'm drawn to gold and I'm, I'm looking at something, the GLD trading up to 183 uh, just after lunch, but then managing to close down half a percent. So the GLD got uh, down to 179 very, very quickly. It was certainly an acceleration going into the close. So, you know, we've had this general theme of stocks appreciating, bonds appreciating, gold appreciating, weaker dollar. Um, and in some ways that sort of, uh, that, that, that uh, combination is changing, it's evolving. And that, that feels about right for where we're at when the S&P is sort of testing a huge key resistance level that so many are seeing and so many are planning for. We're bound to have some disconnection from the trends that got us here. So today we had bonds weaker and then they rallied into yesterday's close, but today the TLT down another almost 1%, that's uh, pushing 10 year yields back up to uh, 67 basis points. The dollar a little bit weaker, going down about a third of a percent using the UUP as a good proxy. That's after it was strong uh, going into the close yesterday. In terms of commodities, overall okay, and silver actually looked like it was going to, you know, pretty pretty nicely rebound from the sell-off yesterday. But silver sold off pretty good into the close, still managed to be above positive, but. Uh, gold, as I mentioned, uh, accelerating more to uh, to the downside. In terms of stocks, the S&P finished up about 1.4%, closing around 3380. And again, 3400, sort of that ultimate level. Tech led the way higher. And so the NASDAQ 100 up uh, over 2.5%, the VIX down uh, to around 22. Mid caps and small caps up, but not nearly as much as large caps. So this is back to that mega cap healthcare tech trade uh, starting to work again. Interesting to see utilities 
uh, number three uh, on, a, on a good follow through day to the upside. Let's look at a chart of the S&P here and orienting ourselves to this, there's been no denying the, the, uh, the, the uptrend that's taken us from the low in March to literally round trip um, from the peak in February, the low in March, and once again now the peak, uh, you know, arguably in, in August. So many are expecting some sort of resistance at 3,400. I would be, I would be amazed, but again, I, I've seen a little of everything. I think at this point, I guess I would, I would deal with it, but I would be amazed if we go materially higher than 3,400 without, without some sort of pullback. And I think the base case that most would be, would be playing off of it, as far as I'm concerned, is a pullback to sort of that 3,200, 3,250 range. That would be the most recent swing low. I think if you're bullish or if you're bearish long term, that's kind of what you'd want to see because either it is a healthy pullback that allows you to build momentum for the next swing higher, or it's the uh, it's the beginning of a multi leg move down. And you know, talking to guests on the show over the last couple of weeks, I mean, we've had a little of both. We've had some to talk about the uh, you know overvaluation, the you know the the rise that has gone too far, the the overbought conditions, bearish divergences. Engulfing patterns, bearish engulfing patterns, which we saw yesterday in a lot of uh, a lot of names, including the S and P. So all of that adds up to uh, an overextended market that needs to pause. Just the fact that it's at the previous highs. On the other hand, you have plenty, and and I go back to my conversation with Craig Johnson months and months ago, where we debated are we going lower or higher. He voted higher, and so far he's certainly been right. With you know he's talked about S and P going to thirty six hundred, which is interesting. That actually is where the measurement goes. If you use that bull flag pattern from early May, that's about back of the envelope where that would measure if that was halfway through the uh, the trend that would put us up around 3600 or so so are we continuing on to uh, on to there most importantly i think regardless of whether you're quote unquote bullish or bearish you have to acknowledge the trend and the trend is made of highs and lows the highs have gone higher the lows have gone higher by any stretch so the market is in an uptrend by definition until proven otherwise the market's going higher so to get materially negative from here, I would want to see a lower high and a lower low. And, and you think about it, that's sort of the beginning of a wave pattern going, going down. Uh, at this point, it's sort of long and strong up and to the right. We talked about the chart of gold. I just want to spend a, a minute on this, of course. So this is the last two years showing you this multi-step process where it's sort of rallied and then pulled back a little bit. Let's zoom into the last uh, maybe year or so just to give a little more clarity here. So if you look at the GLD, uh, you know, earlier today, it's trading around 182.50 and it's feeling like this is a pullback to Fibonacci support. This is now a bounce higher. That feels about right. This is a gap down to a, you know, the first sort of line in the sand, the Fibonacci support level. That makes sense. But all of a sudden we've closed down toward the lows of the day, which means you'd want to see a follow through tomorrow sort of in indicating further weakness in gold. And if so, I think you're looking down here to you know, 170, 172-ish, which would be the 50-day the moving average. That would be the, la the next uh, major Fibonacci support level. That would be this congestion area from early July. That's a big move down from 195 to, to 170 for sure. Uh, but again, if we're not able to hold this level, that's sort, of, uh, that's sort of where we're at. You know, gold has a history of becoming extremely overbought, uh, pulling back or, or pausing before another leg higher. And uh, perhaps this is the beginning of a uh, of, a, of a more significant uh, correction. I think in this sort of environment, it's all about identifying those key levels and seeing when they hold, when they don't, and, uh, and identifying uh, where their opportunities, you know, gold had started to outperform there going into the end of, uh, of last month, now rolling over on a relative basis uh, for sure. You know, semiconductors come to mind uh, as well. You know, as I mentioned, technology uh, in the driver's seat uh, we've uh, we've talked about the XLK on Monday. We looked at uh, a technology in a little more uh, detail, just thinking about that the resiliency when you look at the uh, look at tech versus other sectors. You know, semiconductors pull off a little bit, and and there's a lot of talk about this pause of technology leadership and others, things like industrials, materials, even financials overtaking tech as sort of the new leadership, which would could propel us to further highs. Uh, and as, as we've talked about before, you know, a, a leadership rotation, it's not a, a sudden leadership change. Um, it usually is more of a rotation. I think it's more of an evolution as you see leadership uh, groups like uh, semiconductors start to rotate away and other things take their place. But, but today is sort of uh, back to new closing highs. The SMH made a new 52-week closing high today, uh, up over 3% outperforming the, uh, the market. So 
you know, make no mistake, the, the, the trend in most technology uh, charts looks kind of like this, looks like uh, semiconductors, the relative strength in semiconductors, you know, if you, if you just looked at the relative strength, you wouldn't think there was a major market correction along the course of this uptrend, outperforming the S&P 30% plus over the last 12 months. But indeed, obviously, that's what happened. So it shows you that, that groups like semiconductors have been pretty good in both bull and bear uh, cycles, which tells you it's a, it's a fairly resilient uh, position. It's something that, that's uh, worked pretty well. And again, once again, making new 50 twick highs. I, I would say it's hard to imagine the S&P not in an uptrend when something like semiconductors is making new 50 two week highs. I'd want to see that stopping before I start getting uh, you know, less, uh, less positive on the, uh, on the overall market environment. Just to finish up this overall uh, take, I did want to point out financials finishing more on the, on the downside, also industrials. And industrials as a group have done very well. And it's not some of the ones you'd, uh, you'd, you'd may think. I mean, it's things like, uh, boy, I'm trying to, trying to come up with some of the names. It's more like the FedEx types and names and, and that sort of uh, CHRW comes to mind. These are stocks that have you know, held up really well, score very well on our scooter rankings, still within that, in that industrial uh, sector. So take a look at that sector if you haven't in a while, because there's some, there's some diversity there, but some of the groups are holding up very, very, uh, very, very nicely. As I mentioned, Tesla certainly finishing to the upside. If you look at the top 10 uh, industries, it's sort of that leadership group that you're familiar with. It's biotech, it's home builders, it's computer hardware, it's semiconductors, it's automobiles, which of course is, uh, is, is Tesla's strong performance. So, you know, the, the groups that led today, the sectors that led today are sort of those leadership uh, themes that uh, we've not rotated away from just yet, as far as I can see. That's our recap for today. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with my guest, Jane Galina. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Appreciate you so much joining us uh, every day for the final bar. You can get your questions to us two ways, and we'll do another mailbag segment at the end of the week. We'd be happy to answer your question on the air. Uh, Give us an email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com, or just tag us in a comment on Twitter, at FinalBarSCTV. Anywhere you see our comments on YouTube or elsewhere, just put a comment in there. We look at everything that you post, and we'll answer as much as we can uh, in our mailbag segment at the end of this week. I want to welcome on my guest, Jane Galina, or Airplane Jane, as she goes by, uh, from cjanetrade.com. Uh, Jane has done such a great job on Your Daily Five, which is one of our other shows on Stock Charts TV, sharing some of her insights uh, using her, her toolkit. I wanted to welcome her on the show and, uh, and share some of the charts top of mind for her. So, Jane, welcome to The Final Bar. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, David. Yes, very excited. Thank you for having me on the show. And the two charts that I'm really looking at today, which are going to give me that indication of continuation to this uptrend or else a bit of a pullback are Apple and Microsoft, two of the largest holdings in the SPY and the Qs. Now, Apple had great earnings, also had the announcement of the forward split of the one for four coming up August 31st. And as a result, we've seen an insurgence of buying, it looks like, for the reason that we are above the big candlestick back on, let's see, that is on July 31st. We're above all that high volume right at the moment. Now, David did not mention, I do follow the dark pools of the market. So that would be the trades that the really big guys go ahead and place. It's their receipt. The trade is printed as a print and we follow it bullish above the print or bearish below the print. So we have had some activity on Apple in the past week. So we are very interested to see where we go from here. Now it does look like a bit of a bull flag heading to the upside. We are staying above the moving averages. We are riding the upward trend. There is a bit of a channel to the upside and we're a little overextended from that. So 
if we, I didn't put on the weekly chart, but if we put on the weekly chart, we would see that we do have a little bit of room to go ahead and pull back to 427 or even 405 and stay in that upward trend. So we could easily have a little bit of a pullback and then continue, gather some more momentum, consolidate and move up from there. It's a great chart, Jane, and, and, I, and I love what you just mentioned about, you know, think about the weekly chart. I think a lot of people, given how, how strong, how resilient some of these stocks have been, the moment you see a down day, you start to get really nervous because we just haven't seen many of them. But you're right. I mean, you could still pull back to 405 even and still be within the context of, of a long-term uptrend. I'm curious with, with this chart in particular, before we get to, to your second chart, what would you see that would tell you the uptrend is over? What would, what would signify, I mean, would it be a break below 405 or is a, a different toolkit you would use to tell you, okay, the uptrend is over, start to be, you know, it's time to lean away from something like Apple? Well, I would definitely see where we are in relation to the dark pool. You mm -hmm. know, obviously we start to drop below that, then likely there could have been some selling at the top. But as we've looked at it right now, I also follow short volume interest. So the short volume interest was recently up around 65% back until August 5th. Now it's slowly dropped. There's 40%. So that means there's more confidence and more money going in to Apple, more buying instead of shorting, which to me leads me to believe as well that the general public has confidence in Apple as being a long and strong stock to go into. Um, to answer your question about a pullback, following where the dark pool prints are, but we also have two gaps on the chart. We have a gap between 432 down to 425. So if that gap, yep, right there, if that gap does fill to the downside and also a gap below that 411 down to 396. So if we start to break that 400 level, you can see there was a strong resistance there for a good week. And if we do break that to the downside, I would really watch it to see if we're going to go ahead and continue that downward trend and complete the gap between the 30th and 31st all the way down to 386. So we only have a minute left, but I did want to get to your second chart chain. Yep. This is uh, sticking with big tech, looking at Microsoft. What, tell us about this one. So Microsoft, we do have three black crows right there, and we've slowly had a pullback on the chart. Um, when we look at the weekly, again, we have just tested the bottom bound of the upward channel. So on this one, if we do drop below 204, would really be interested. We have had some dark pool activity on this, and being the top holding in the, again, the spy in the queues, if this one starts to pull back, it could follow suit that others tend to follow it. It's two great charts, and I think you've hit on you know some some concern, I think, but some opportunity, right? Understanding some of these larger names that are pulling back to uh, to key support levels. And Jane, I have to thank you for uh, for the candle refresher, throwing the three black crows uh, pattern in there. It takes me back to studying for uh, studying technical analysis and learning all the patterns. Jane Galina, thank you so so much for coming on the show. Uh, congrats on all you're doing with CJaneTrade.com, and look forward to having you back on again soon. All right. Thank you, David. It was Jane Galena. Uh, you can check her information out at cjanetrade.com. Also, your daily five. She's hosted that show a number of times for us on Stock Charts TV. And I love that idea. I think, I think for, for many of us, you, know, you, you start to see stocks like Microsoft pull back uh, and you see the three down days, the three, three black crows, which is a, a, a candle pattern identifying you know, a multi-day pullback, those three large uh, down candles. But it's always very important, as we've talked about, to connect what you see in the short term with the longer term trends. And, and as she had mentioned with both of those, the weekly charts can give you a sense of the long term trends and where you might be at in the short term cycle relative to those. Let's get to the next segment called banking on breadth. So occasionally we love to look in particular at, at, uh, at breadth measures. As I've talked to you a number of times before, if you watch the show, you know, I, I see the market, a macro perspective in three phases. You know, most important is price. Secondary to that, to confirm what you see in price is breadth. So looking at the characteristics of who, what stocks, what names are actually doing the movements. And then third is sentiment and trying to qualify or validate what you see with price and breadth using surveys and, and, uh, and, and flows and, and things like that. So let's focus on this idea of breadth and see what the conditions are. And if I would summarize this segment <laughs> briefly, it is things are very constructive. It, it's, it, you'd be hard pressed to find things that are sort of negative. So what I'm going to do is, is obviously, you know, hit on all the positive things that I'm seeing when you look at breadth, but hit on anything that could be construed as negative just to check ourselves and see if there are opportunities to, to be thinking more 
for potential downside than upside. So we're going to start with looking at stocks relative to their moving averages. And the first chart is a, a daily chart, but going back quite a ways. This is going back to 2002, uh, mid-2002. And we're looking at the percent of stocks on the New York Stock Exchange and then uh, the S&P 500. And this is the percent of names in those groups above their 200-day simple moving averages. What's interesting is if you look at the S&P, it's just about 62% of stocks above their 200-day. This is not updated for today, by the way, so that, that's going to update uh, when we run all the, the closing data and update these uh, breadth measures in a little bit. You'll see those uh, most likely uptick given the, the rally that you saw today. Um, but overall, it's, uh, you know, as of, uh, as of Tuesday's close, it's, uh, it's 62%, which means one in, you know, two in three, excuse me, are above their 200-day uh, moving averages. What's interesting, the reason why we're starting with the longer term view is if you look back over the last 15 odd years of, uh, of, of the S&P 500, you can see that bullish market phases have this indicator remain, uh, sort of go above 50% and sort of remain above that. On pullbacks, um, it gets down to about 50%, maybe a little bit below there, maybe 40%, but overall quickly goes back up into that, uh, into that over 50% range. And that's sort of what extended bull markets are made of. When it goes below 50% and stays below there, that in general tends to be uh, the signal that we're in deeper corrections. That's what 2008 to 2009 did. You also saw that in 2010 and 2011. These were deeper, more painful pullbacks, 15 and 16 as well. So it tells you that it's gonna be more of a longer drawn out corrective sort of period. Obviously the market uh, always has resolved higher going back in the, in the deep history of, uh, of equity. So, What's positive here is the fact that we're above 50%. When the market was rallying and we had not gone above 50%, that was one of the things that I talked about as, uh, as being a bit of a, of a warning sign we're now above there. So on any pullback, which I would assume we get here at some point, I will be looking at this chart and seeing if we're able to remain above 50%. That would be one data point that would tell me uh, that, that it's, a, it's a healthy pullback within an uptrend. Interesting to note that if you look at the broader New York Stock Exchange, which includes a lot of other types of things, closed end funds and other stuff, it's, uh, it's just above 50%, actually just closed above 50% in the last week or so. So overall, this has actually been lagging behind the S&P 500, which is obviously a little more weighted towards you know, large cap uh, US stocks. If we zoom in a little bit, now we're looking at the S&P and the percent above their 200 day like we saw previously, and also the percent above the 50 day. And a couple of my guests, I wanna say Gary Dean from Sentiment Timing, um, Andrew Thrasher from Thrasher Analytics, both referred to this indicator. And Andrew in particular, I remember talking about how every rally that we see in stocks over the last couple months, less and less uh, stocks above their 50 day. And that's an interesting point. It's a you know, potential area of concern that every time the S&P has gone to a new swing high, less and less stocks are going above their 50 day moving average. It's a bit of a divergence there. And I see what he's saying. That's actually, uh, that's actually totally fair. For me though, again, price is number one. And I, I would look to see when we you know, break support, when this uh, trend actually reverses, that's my signal that uh, things are going negative. But that's certainly one indicator to watch to see if if we do break to new highs, does that percent above the 50-day continue to increase? The next one is looking at advancers, decliners, and just refreshing the chart here very quickly. It looked like about 65%, yeah, just over that, uh, finishing higher on the day, 30%, uh, 32%. Uh, down on the day. This is on the New York Stock Exchange. What strikes me looking at this is over the last couple months, you can see we've had less and less big distribution days. And that's certainly how it's felt. I mean, if you look, the average day has been sort of positive and we haven't had a lot of big negative days. We've had a couple, but even on those big negative days, it hasn't been a 90% down day. In a really painful market sell-off, you will start to see this indicator increase. And we saw one of those days here in mid-June where you saw 90% stocks down that was on uh, in this pullback to the 200 day moving average, but you really haven't seen many of these. And on an average, even the down days, it's less than 50% of stocks over the last couple of weeks. So that speaks to a, a, a certainly a, a, um, a not a narrow uh, up move, but a broad move of the average stock closing higher and higher. If you look, we haven't had a 50% plus down day in, uh, in a couple of weeks. If you look at new highs and new lows, we've had a consistent amount of new highs. It's topped out around 45 to 50 uh, names in the S&P. That's about 99 to 10% of the S&P 500, if you think about that's how the, the math would work. So it's, uh, it, it, the, the short answer is it's not many. Most stocks are not above uh, their uh, January, February, December, wherever they topped out. They haven't eclipsed those highs yet. But 
we're getting close. And I, I would say seeing this number materially go higher, if you see increases in there, that tells you more and more stocks are doing what the S&P is trying to do and winning, actually eclipsing that February high. If you see this maintain where it is, it tells you it's a small number of names, relatively speaking, that are able to go to new highs. The average stock hasn't been able to do it yet. That would speak to some internal weakness. This chart, I updated color coding uh, wise to, uh, to being all green just for the, for the show today. Usually I do this every Friday. Um, but what I'm looking at here is the fact that the cumulative advanced decline lines across the board, large cap, mid cap, small cap, all positive. So basically all, uh, all of them have now broken above their June highs and I think uh, remained above them. They've demonstrated that the breadth is positive. Uh, you know, for a little while you had the S&P going higher with other cap tiers not confirming that. I think that's changed and you've now seen all of them confirm that to the upside, which just tells you that it is a broad advance that we're in the middle of. On balance volume, uh, you know, again, we've talked about lighter volume and, and the volume that you saw back here in March and April, even in June versus what we've seen recently. Um, but again, I, I learned a long time ago, if the market goes higher on lower volume, that's interesting, but the key there is the market going higher. That's the biggest tell, right? And as long as the market's going higher volume or not, that's a, that's a secondary input uh, relative to, uh, to the price itself. But the OBV, the on-balance volume, which is Joe Granville's way of, of accumulating those volume reads over time, continue to confirm an uptrend for stocks. Finally, we'll finish them with the McClellan Oscillator, the McClellan Summation Index. These are two ways of measuring advancers, decliners, just smoothing it out with exponential averages. Long story short, positive. Uh, the McClellan oscillator remaining above zero, uh, dipping below it at the end of last month, but overall remaining positive just speaks to the internal strength of the market. So, you know, a look at breadth tells me, I mean, the average chart in there is, is pretty positive, to be honest with you. I think it's recognizing the uptrend if and when we see a pullback. And again, I would be amazed if we don't have some pullback off of S&P 3400-ish, which is where we're at now. The breadth indicators, these charts uh, what I would look at to get a read on uh, on potential downside and indications that the long uh, long term uptrend has exhausted. We're not seeing it yet. That is uh, it for our banking on breath. We need to wrap the show. Three charts in three minutes. This is the three and three, and it starts now. Chart number one is a long term chart of the uh, of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. One of my former uh, uh, colleagues at Fidelity, Mark Dibble, was my senior analyst when I uh, was. Uh, working with the technical research department there, a, a fantastic experience with a really good group of people. Uh, he just pinged me earlier today and said it is the 38th uh, anniversary of the 1982 market low, which I did not realize till I opened his, uh, his message. Here's the 1982 low. This is the Dow going back to uh, basically World War II. This is the rally in the 1950s, the go-go years of the 1960s. Here's the secular bear market of the 1970s. There's the 74 low. We retested that sort of a lower end in of the cycle in 78. This is the 82 low. And the reason why it's a fantastic chart is it shows you that 16 year cycle, how long it took from when the Dow hit 1000 to when it finally eclipsed it, uh, which was after the 1982 low into 1983, when it finally uh, broke above 1000 to never look back uh, as far as, uh, as, far as we, can, we can tell since then. But this is a, a key, key point, and I think the key looking back there is the fact that you kept establishing higher lows, a consistent resistance, but you kept putting the higher lows. This indeed was a base building up for one of the biggest bull markets in market history. That's chart number one. Second one is looking at small versus large. Uh, small caps actually outperformed large caps pretty well in April and May. That ended at the June market peak when uh, this ratio came back down, when it broke down through trendline support right about here, I remember thinking that's the end of small caps on a relative basis, it's back to large, but that trend has changed and, and it's once again been favoring uh, small caps over the last three to four plus weeks. And I, I continue to monitor this. This speaks to the benefits of stock picking and screening for ideas, especially outside of large cap in the mid cap and small cap. There are names there that are outperforming that are names you may not be familiar with. I'd be, uh, I'd be getting familiar with them. Finally is gold. The last couple days have been uh, certainly painful if you're thinking of gold on the long term, but I think similar to uh, Jane Galena's charts on Apple and Microsoft, at this point, I, th I still think you can characterize this as pullbacks within a longer term uptrend. This is a, an important time to be focusing on downside potential and where you'd think to reevaluate it. Looking at this chart, if we continue lower, I think you look down to the 61.8% retracement level. It's just around 171 to 172. 
that it lines up with that consolidation we had in July before the parabolic uh, rise in gold. So the GLD and even spot gold, interesting charts to look at right about here. Folks, that's our show for today. A special thank you to Jane Galena from cjntrade.com for joining us from Montreal today, sharing her thoughts on uh, big cap technology. Get your questions to us via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. For stockcharts.com and Revin Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.